All right, everybody grab your Bible. Raise it up high. You got it? Yep. I ain't telling you where to go yet. All right. You don't have to hold it up for this next part. You can put it back down. People going to be smelling each other's armpits in a second. Just chill. All right. <laughs> we, hold, we hold in our, our hands a Bible. It's the Word of God, man. We hold in our hands this Bible. There is no other book like it. There, 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 there's no other book that even comes close to comparing to what this is right here. Amen? That's awesome. I mean, there, there's no other book that was written over a 1,500-year time span by 40 different authors of all kinds of backgrounds. I mean, kings, shepherds, statesmen, peasants, tax collectors, fishermen, right? You know what I'm saying? That was written by people like that over three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, different styles, like poetry and, and, and things like that, different like types of locations, palaces, dungeons out in the wilderness, that all say the same thing. There's no other book that has all that going on like the Bible does in the world. And, all, and though all that happened, they all say the same thing and they point to the same thing. Jesus. They all point to Jesus. That's awesome, ain't it? Isn't it cool to have the most amazing possession that you could ever have in your hands right now? I mean, it's great. Uh, the Bible, and just give you a quick lesson before I get into, get into my message. The Bible, if you've opened it up, you've noticed a couple things. It's kind of split in two big parts. It's split into the Old Testament and the what? Yes. <laughs> the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament has how many books? 39. New Testament has 27. So we've got how many books? We got 66 books that's kind of split Old Testament and New Testament. All right, a testament, I'm going to keep this a little bit brief because I'm not going to get into that so much, but testament, just think of it as like a will or a covenant of sorts, all right, just for today, just a will or a covenant. So what we have uh, in this book is an Old Testament and a New Testament, all right? The New Testament begins at the death of Christ. Now, our Old Testament and New Testament is kind of split like between um, Malachi and, and, and Matthew. But, you know, the New Testament started at the death of Christ, and the Gospels are there because they bring the life of Christ to his death and all that. This New Testament, Old Testament. The Old Testament is defined as old. Now, I'm just giving you the, with how the Bible talks about the Old Testament. It calls it Old Testament. Flip in your Bibles. I'll show you what I mean. Flip in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. When you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, say truth. You guys are fast. Like verse 14, for example, chapter 2 Corinthians 3, 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the what? The Old Testament. It's called the Old Testament in the Bible. The Bible calls it that. Don't, don't get too um, um, pulled into that verse yet, because I'm going to come back there in a second. Whereas the New Testament is, is the New Testament. It's a new covenant. The Old Testament was glorious. The law was glorious, but the New Testament, the New Covenant, is more glorious than that. 
The Old Testament emphasized the law of Moses. The New Testament focuses on the sacrifice of Christ. But again, they all point to that one person, that moment in history. The Old Testament is referred to as the ministration of condemnation, whereas the New Testament is referred to as the ministration of righteousness. The Old Testament talked about life under the law. The New Testament talks about life found in Christ. The Old Testament, it was, quote, done away, fulfilled, abolished. The Bible uses words like that to talk about the Old Testament. The New Testament, it, it remains today. The Old Testament, and especially the law, was a, was a covering veil. We'll talk about that in a minute. In the New Testament, the gospel through the Spirit removes that veil. The New Testament, as we'll see here in just a minute, talks a lot about liberty and life in Christ. Think of a skyscraper. When you drive around, you see a skyscraper, you see height and you see strength. But one of the things that you don't always get to see is the craftsmanship the architecture and the foundation that is holding up that skyscraper. And as we're like in this time of our church that we're in, and we've got construction going on over here, and we see it every day, uh, one of the things that my mind was kind of uh, shifting to when I was thinking of Old Testament and New Testament uh, was, was our, our project over here. Right now, we're putting in a foundation. Before we put in the foundation, we had to dig the footers out. We know from the scripture that Christ is the foundation. And so, in a sense, the Old Testament is the digging out of all the footers so the foundation of Christ can be poured and laid and established. He's the cornerstone man. The Old Testament, though, I want to emphasize, is not just something that we pay no attention to anymore. You hear people say that, don't you? Like, why are you even in the Old Testament? I've had people say, why did you preach in the Old Testament today? Well, uh, because it's the Bible. <laughs> I preach the whole Bible. But I've had several people ask me that. And I've had, you know, this is like only these last 27 books. I'm like, is this the Word of God or not? Man, when I read the Old Testament, you know the first thing I see? The creation of all of existence. You want me to like pass up that? I see, I see the law given. I see moral ethics and, and conduct that we still live by today. Morality. I see that in the Old Testament. The, the Old Testament's awesome. The, I, see, I see prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. I see prophecies of things still yet to come in the Old Testament. We see in the Old Testament that the characteristics of God, how just how God is all powerful, all knowing, just, righteous, all these things we get to see like who God is in the Old Testament. Goodness, we see appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. Old Testament's awesome. And the Old Testament, like I was saying before, it's it's pointing us to Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to start in verse 15, and I want to go to chapter 4, verse 6 today. All right? You ready? Ready? Everybody say yeah. All right, good. All right, you're here. Let's go. <laughs> 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. All right, now let me give you a little, just get you up to speed real quick so we can run. All right, even today when Moses is read, the veil is still on their what? It's on their heart. In, in the Old Testament, that, that law of Moses was considered a veil. And you can even go back and think of like the veil. Remember when Moses came down from the mount? He had been in the presence of God. His face was shining. And the people couldn't take the glory that was all over his face. Remember that? And they couldn't take it. So what do you have to do? He put a veil 
When he would talk to them, he was veiled. But when he was back in the presence of God, what did he do? No veil, because the veil, in a sense, is an obstruction to something. There's something that you're not seeing or something that they're not seeing. You with me? For the people, they couldn't see the glory of God that was radiating off the face of Moses. I don't know about you, but I feel like where I'm at today, I want to see that glory. I would want to see that glory, even though it's a reflection of the ultimate source. But they couldn't do it. it he was veiled. And, and the Bible says, even unto this day, when the Moses is read, it, there's a veil over their hearts. Okay, my aim this morning is to make sure you don't have a veil over your heart and then to point to the light. That's what I'm trying to do. That's why the cute little girl, I haven't learned her name yet, uh, but there's a veil. You can't see something. And then I was really hoping she'd say, I see light. I was, I was hoping. It didn't work out. I want to make sure this morning that before you leave, and I know only by the power of God he can do this, that nobody walks out of here with a veil over your face. And you've seen the light. He's, he's talking, of course, he's talking to some Israelites by background. They're the ones who are naturally going to be reading the law. And it's like when they read this, there's a veil over their face. Nevertheless, man, I'd go to Isaiah 25, 6 through 8, look that up sometime. It's like a prophecy about how the Lord is going to remove the veil off of the people of the whole world. It's awesome. Nevertheless, in verse 16, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Let me, let me, let me say that this. When the heart turns to the Lord, now I believe the direct context of it is, is a person's heart, and you could say a broader context is the heart of the people of Israel, but let's, let's stay, stay at the roots. The heart, when the heart turns to the Lord, guess what? The veil is removed. You, you, uh, we had a special morning. We got to share communion with each other, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to make sure we're oriented to Christ. And I'm telling you if, you, if you never have, if you've never turned to the Lord, I'm telling you, you're in the dark. You're, you're blind. You're, we'll see in a second. You're blind. But man, this morning, if you would, my prayer is that you would turn your heart to Jesus this morning. Let that veil come out from in front of you and, so you can actually see what's before you. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Because of the Spirit of God, we have eyes to see. We, he, the Spirit of God helps us uh, come to Christ, and that veil is taken away, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And one thing I know is that when you have light, you, you see the light. And when you turn your heart to Jesus, and you have that freedom and that liberty, it is transformative in your entire existence. Your entire existence transforms. It can't stay the same. When you come to Christ, when you turn your heart to Christ, there is no staying the same. Not only have you seen the light of the gospel, but you also have access to to the Lord yourself. I love how it talks about a veil uh, and the veil of Moses, but also like the veil in the temple that was rent at Christ's uh, crucifixion, man. It's just like, hey, I don't know about you, but I want to have an unveiled opportunity to see a, the reflection of God's glory, and I want to have access to Him. I want to have both of that. And praise God, He wants us to have both of that, those things. But we all, verse 18 says, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That is a powerful verse right there. If it's the first time you've seen that, it might be a little daunting to try to understand what that means. That's why God calls people to take the Word of God and break it down plainly for anybody and everybody to hear it. So let me break this down for you. 
We all. So it's talking about Christians. It's talking about people who have turned their heart to Christ and have been saved. We all, with open face, there is no veil. With open face, we behold like in a glass. And, and it's the glass is the, what they would use to behold something in a glass. They'd have like polished metal, for example. They'd be able to see the reflection of something. And it's almost like the story with Moses. Like before he put the veil, what they could see, it was like through a glass in a sense, or like in a glass, because he was reflecting the glory that he had seen. Now one day, one day, we're going to be able to see him in his glory. But until we get that glorified body, we see him this way. It's still glory, man. It's still glorious. He's, we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, guess what? We're what? Changed. I said this light and this liberty is transformative. When you turn your heart to look and receive Christ, it will transform your life. It even says here that we are changed into the same image. What image? The image that we got to behold. The glorious light of the Lord. We change into that image. You say, what, how in the world does that work out? There are so many scriptures in the Bible that talks about how we are regularly being conformed into the image of Jesus. So, it's, I like, and I like how it says, um, we're changed into the same image because we've been beholding His face. And you hear me say all the time, whatever you behold, you become. If you behold sin all the time, you're going to become that. If you behold the face of Jesus, you're going to be more conformed into His image. And there are so many scriptures that outline that. Romans 12, 2 says, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Colossians 3, 10 says, having put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. John 3, 2 says, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Romans 8.29 says, uh, For whom he did foreknow, he, who, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. He's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. And I love this one. Philippians 3.20 and 21 says this, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may, may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And so when we come back into this, we, we're beginning to see that now that when we turn our hearts to Christ, we receive Him, we have liberty. Because we're beholding His glory, we are being transformed and changed into the same image that we behold from glory to glory. From glory to glory depicts your entire Christian life. From glory to glory. The glory, the moment that you saw the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Glory number one. Regeneration, man. Justification. And then as we live our life, we're being sanctified. And we're being conformed into His image. One day He's going to call us home. He's going to give us glorified bodies. It began with the glorious light of the gospel. It's going to end with glorious new bodies. And we're going to be able to see him as he is because we shall be like him. You with me? Man, we're just getting started here. The only way to get to that point is you have to receive Christ as your Savior and be transformed. Yeah. And at the end of that, it says, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord does all this for us. All we have to do is see Jesus. Follow Jesus. Let the Spirit of God do the rest, man. Chapter 4, verse 1. I didn't realize this until yesterday. My wife's like, what are you preaching tomorrow? And I gave her my passage of Scripture. And she's like, 
the last verse is our ladies retreat verse. I'm like, I didn't have any idea. Sorry, ladies, I didn't look at your stuff on the app. But I didn't know it. This is good. He's got us, he's bringing us all into the same, the same page here. Therefore, I was going to start in chapter 4, verse 1, but because the first word's therefore, I had to back up a little bit to get us going. So now I'm starting the message, I guess. <laughs> therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. All right, we have this ministry. I think it's pretty easy to know that our main ministry in life is to get saved and then help other people get saved and grow closer to Jesus. I mean, kind of in a nutshell, that, that's a ministry that we all have. Now, some handle the Word of God and teach from the Word of God a little more than others, but we all have this ministry where once we're transformed by the power of God, we are supposed to share that with other people. You have a ministry. You have a ministry that you have received of the Lord. I do too. It's the most important ministry that anybody could ever have. Share the gospel. We have to make sure, and we're going to see in a second, we have to make sure that we are not hiding the gospel. You hear me say all the time, the gospel can't stop at you. It can't end with you. It has to keep going. It came to you because it's on its way to somebody else too. With me? I'm getting hot up. I was talking to my uh, pastor's training class this morning, and we kind of zeroed in on this um, verse 2. You know, it's important that we renounce hidden things of dishonesty. It's important that we don't walk in craftiness, that we make sure that we handle the Word of God honestly or not deceitfully. And uh, manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience. One of the things we're trying to get at with people when we're taking the word of God and bring it to their life is we're trying to get to their heart so they can turn to the Lord. But we have to do that honestly, not deceitfully. There are so many people. I just want to, I, I just, I'm thankful that for our, our commitment to the Word of God here at this church. And it's all the way across. Everybody here that serves, that I know of, you take the Word of God seriously, it's important to you. It, it, it's that foundation for like what we're about. I, I love that. I love seeing that. I love, I love just seeing that play out in different ministries and things like that. But one of the things that's important for us to do as we're serving the Lord is you make sure that you handle the Word of God honestly. Amen? That means you have to study it. That means you have to like try to make sense of some things that you don't quite understand. You, you need to dig in and study it. You get it in context and all these things. If you're not careful, you'll, if you don't know the Word of God, you could be led astray by somebody who says they know the Word of God, but they're manipulating it and using it deceitfully and craftily. You can easily be deceived. Because some people, all they want is just some kind of power trip. And they, they, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say if you take it out of context. And there's people who build entire ministries on handling the Word of God deceitfully. And it sucks so many people in. And they're deceived. You can make the Bible say anything you want. If you want the Bible to say, God knows my heart. <laughs> give, me, give me grace here for a second. If you want the Bible to say, there is no God, you can get the Bible to say that. Because the Bible says that. But right before that it says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. You see what I mean? If you don't handle the word right, 
You can take anything out of anywhere and you can make the Bible say anything you want. So make sure that you personally are handling the Word of God honestly and the people that you are allowing to teach you and preach to you, make sure they are doing the same thing. Or man, they can yank you all over the place. But, verse 3, but if, I love how Paul said, our gospel it's our gospel. It's the same gospel. It's the same gospel that saved me, that saved you, that saved your great, 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 great grandma. It's the same gospel that saved Paul. It's the same gospel. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. you got a couple things going on. Or... Let me just start with this. It's not the gospel's fault if it's not heard. It's not the gospel's fault. Because God made it very clear what the gospel was, gave it to everybody. We've been entrusted with the gospel, and he tells us to go and proclaim it to the world. If somebody doesn't hear the gospel, it's not the gospel's fault. That's like blaming the sun if somebody didn't open their eyes to watch the sunset. It's not the son's fault you didn't see it. It's not the gospel's fault that it's hid. It could be our fault for not sharing it. We keep it to ourselves. And it's also Satan's fault. Because Satan's on the other side trying to keep people from seeing it. Satan's on the other side doing this to as many lost people as he can so that they don't come to the light or see the light of the glorious gospel. Look at the next verse. In whom, so, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Man, this is a powerful verse. There's so much to unpack in this one. Keep this verse on the screen because I want this one, the scriptures speak to it. In whom the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Satan. Satan's the God of this world. He's also called the prince of the powers of the air, which is kind of crazy because like all of our news and social media and all that stuff goes on airwaves. Ooh, don't go down that road, but it's weird. All right, so he's the God of this world. And you can go all the way back because because. In the beginning, Adam and Eve had a rule. Don't eat it. Don't even touch it. Here comes Satan. Satan said, that's not true. Adam and Eve submitted to the devil. They submitted to him. The devil loves when people submit to him. The devil loves when he can make people feel or believe that God was wrong. That's what he did in the garden. He's the God of this world. He loves being sacrificed to and for. He's evil. He's evil. He loves being worshipped. He has the affections of most people in the world. I mean, if you... if. If the Bible says that broad is the path to destruction and narrow is the way to heaven, you can say he has the affections of most of the people in this world. He's the God of this world, lowercase g. His will is obeyed. His plans are executed. People sacrifice for, them, for him and he keeps them into dark, in the dark. As much as possible. Because he's trying to keep people from salvation. He doesn't want them to see the what? Light. Look, you see that in verse 4? He blinds the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious what? Gospel. So the light is in the gospel. You with me? This is awesome to think about. Because the light is in the gospel. The glorious light that transforms people's entire lives that helps you to be able to look at them and be like, oh my goodness, look at the glory of God radiating, reflecting off that person. It's because they've been changed and transformed by the glorious light of the gospel. 
And Satan's over here trying to like keep that light turned off. Keep people from seeing that light. The gospel of Christ it says, who is the image of God, that that gospel, that that light should shine unto them. And he says in verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but what? Christ Jesus the Lord. You get somebody that's preaching themselves to you, they're not preaching the gospel. Because the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, he get, he's got it right, he said, we preach not ourselves, we preach Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. You're saved to serve. You're saved to deliver the gospel message. And we do that for Jesus' sake because we serve the Lord. For God, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. <laughs> Man, hey, the devil can keep his keep his hands on you, can cover you up, he can try to block as much as he can block, but there is one thing that he can't do ultimately, is he can't block the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, because God and only God can command light to shine in darkness. He did back in Genesis, in the beginning of time, he says, let there be light. That's why I'm saying all I'm doing today, this morning, is hoping and helping that you don't have a veil in front of your face, that you understand that there is something that you could turn your heart to that would absolutely transform your life, and that is the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm pointing to that light. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, man... Open your eyes to the light. Turn your heart, open your eyes, and see the light. He says, but God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, and I love how it says this, in the face of Jesus Christ. It's almost like there's a spotlight. The, the light of the glorious gospel, who... Who is that spotlighting? It's shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Because it's Jesus Christ that saves. And, and when you come to Jesus Christ, I love how, how it even makes that reference that you can see the light in the face of Jesus Christ. No veil. Not like Moses, who nobody wanted to see. No you can actually see the light of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ because it was Him that authored that eternal salvation for you and for me. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, turn your heart to Him. If you're here, you know Jesus, you're a Christian, you need to make sure that you are serving the Lord and taking that gospel to those who are being blinded. Jesus wants to be seen. He wants to be known. Satan's a coward. Jesus wants to be seen and known right here and right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed. You're getting baptized right now. You can go ahead and get ready. If you're here this morning, just privately between me and you and the Lord, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you say, I have never turned my heart to the Lord, I've never been saved. I've never opened my eyes to that gospel. I've never let the Lord change my life. But I would like to be saved. 
I, w- I would love to have all my sins forgiven. I'd love to come to Christ right here and right now, right where you sit. If that's you, will you just look at me? Look at me until I see you. Look me in the eyes until I see you, just so I know who I'm talking to. You say, I don't know if I'm saved, but I sure would like to be. Anybody at all like that this morning? Just look at me until I see you. Anybody at all like that this morning? Maybe you've, uh, that light of the glorious gospel, man, maybe you've, uh, maybe you've turned the dimmers on in your life. Maybe that just needs renewed this morning. Can we just take a few minutes and can we bow before the Lord in your chair or at the altar? Can we Ask the Lord to renew that glory. Maybe ask the Lord to show you who you need to witness to. Let's take a few minutes, pray, sing, and we'll baptize.
He just disappeared in front of everybody just then. <laughs> this is Carter. Carter, have you received Jesus as your Savior? Do you want to live for him forever? It's upon your profession of faith. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, bearing the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. God is good, amen. Amen. Pray for this young man. We talked about foundations and things like that today. He just got saved this week, and he's not ashamed of it. Amen? That's awesome. 